we are at the end of a long journey. Back in September, we started on this series of explorations on how does Web3 and the decentralized web interact and contribute to civil society and how can civil society get engaged with that community. And so here we are at the end of those 16 events. And I think we've learned a tremendous amount and I encourage all of you to go and visit us at our website where we're documenting out the videos and the learnings from all of these sessions. Leading us through these 16 sessions has been Ann Connolly, who's been our subject matter expert and basically the shepherd for us as we figure out where do these two communities interact and what can we learn from each other. And so I'm going to pass it over to Anne, who is going to center us for what is today going to look like? Welcome That's everyone amazing. else who's I, hopped I, on. I, Great. Thank you so much. So yeah, welcome everybody. Thanks for that. That's an amazing thing. How do you do that? That was really cool. Anyway, you have to teach us that after we get off, but okay, yeah, yes. yeah, <laughs> that's great. So welcome back. This is our final session, as Eli mentioned, and we are very excited to welcome back Michelle Wakar. She is head of ecosystem at Octant and recently co-authored the State of Web3 Grants Report and created the Protocol Party Game as a researcher in the Ethereum Foundation's Summer of Protocols program. She's a Forbes 30 under 30, two-time TEDx speaker, uh, and has worn many hats in years prior, including being a media entrepreneur, a community builder, and a writer. So uh, Michelle is here to answer all of your questions. So feel free to ask about anything you want, things you don't understand about blockchain or crypto, you wanna tell us all about your organization and we can help you understand how you might be able to incorporate blockchain into what you're doing or take some first steps to um, getting your organization into the Web3 space. And uh, yeah, so definitely feel free to join on camera if you'd like to, or just to, to hop on with questions. Welcome everyone. Does anyone wanna kick us off with, with something with a question for, for Michelle or myself? I love those gifs as a side note. Like, I want to know how to do this. <laughs> That's really cool. Hi, John. Good to see you again. Thank you. Really enjoyed uh, last week's uh, presentation. And Michelle, I did reach out to you. I was the one who reached out to you on, it was tell uh, one of the messaging apps. I can't even remember now. But uh, anyway, you had your, last week you had presented some research links and I'll be glad to put those in the chat here. And uh, I'd be curious to know, you had various subject categories there. And I just sent them in the chat here, where you had some research links to token models, community building, DAO onboarding, grant programs, protocols, and quadratic funding and voting. Those links are those your own personal research, those represent your own personal research. So I was just wondering if maybe you could go through those and just talk about a little bit about maybe the general concept and then what you found in your research along those lines. Sure. Let me share a few. Okay, so this is a piece I wrote for Forefront with a crypto media company. And it was really about rethinking community design. And I can start off with that one. Community has become a dirty word, I'd say, in, in, in the sense that everyone uses the word way too flexibly and just, it's just everyone's trying to build a community. Everything's a community. <laughs> and I went into a few different nuances in terms of why we need to rethink community design. And as part of that, I mentioned a few different things. And so you can read the full piece here, but the gist of that was really that we should rethink how... We, I think the first step to rethinking community design is a lot of people typically have metrics like comments or likes or just engagement where someone has to put an effort. But I feel like the way that we look at that is a little bit maybe misaligned in terms of expectations and it's a little bit wrong. And I say that because if I look at my own activity or when I, when I see most communities, there's a big chunk of people who are just lurking. And lurking really just means looking at the content without engaging in any way. And... That to me is a form of engagement because everyone's trying to pull your attention and you are playing an attention game when you build anything. The fact that someone's looking at the message or the post in itself is a form of engagement. 
And that's a really strong metric. It's unrealistic to expect the majority of your community to be engaging and to be active. You're only going to have a subset of folks who go on and make the effort to share and to show up in the way people typically expect them to. So the way we look at community activity needs to change a little bit. And so any amount of time you can get, any amount of FaceTime or even thinking time from a person is really valuable. And so even if you think about how do people engage in your own community, that was like one of the things in like a perspective shift. I think lurkers are a very important part of any community and any kind of engagement. And yeah, if for all the posting that happens, you really do want people that are interested in looking at what's happening, right? So that was really one, one part of it. And then I went into a couple of other ways in terms of how to really reassess in what community means in Web3 in particular, where for a lot of folks, it's a sense of identity. It's a social status, depending on which community you're a part of, and you're part of an in-group and went into those nuances and how that's shifted in, in this industry. So that's one piece. And then there's another one, which is like a how-to guide on quadratic funding. And this one was published in Gitcoin, but let me share the links to that because this is on their blog. So if you have ever participated in a QF round, or if you want to understand how to participate in one, this is really like a how-to guide that kind of breaks down what it is and, and how to, yeah, really just breaks all of that down. And then let me share a couple of other links from on the QF side, because what I did was I did a couple of other case studies. One of them go into, oh yeah, this is an interesting one. So this is Arbitrum, which is a layer two. They've been giving out a bunch of funding to a bunch of different projects. And what they're trying to do is this would be a good one for you to look at if you're thinking about um, building on a layer two. They will actually match funds if it's a project that um, is interesting enough to them. And so I think there's categories that they've defined that are on their forum. So look at the conversations happening in the Arbitrum DAO. Um, forum. And so they'll match funding, number one. And number two, they've got their own rounds that they've been running. So I covered two rounds. And what they allowed their community to do is they broke it down. So they had a pool of funding that was run by Plurality Labs. And before deciding which projects should get funding, what they actually wanted to figure out was what categories are important and how should this big pot of funding be divided in terms of category. So this was an interesting use case because what they did here was they opened up four different categories and then a fifth one was anything that doesn't fall into the first four bucket. And then people could donate to the different categories and that would decide which category got more funding from this bigger pool. And that was very interesting because they got over $5,000 in donations directly and they mm -hmm. were able to really get a lot of understanding in terms of the categories that were more interesting to people. So that was the first. And then the second part of that was the actual projects. And they opened up submissions to projects for those categories and to be able to apply. And that got a lot of activity as well. And a lot of projects got funding. But what was interesting was the projects that had more interest in the first round and the donations didn't necessarily match up the individual project donations. And so the second round was a little bit different. And depending on the kind of project, it seemed like there were certain projects that just felt more important to the community and that they were more interested in. And so it was a cool way to see how all of that got split up. So this is one of the case studies to look at. These guys are also doing another round. So this case study is about grad stack, which is how they did these two rounds, but they've also announced a hundred thousand dollars for, I think it's six rounds on a platform called joke race and joke race helps run funding and engagement and community contests and things like that. So that's another announcement that's been making rounds. And I think you're, yeah, that's going to be open to funding. Yeah. They're going to open up applications soon as well. And then there was another one that I, that was an interesting case study it was this one called GeoWeb. And they were interesting because it was the first time that I saw around and I covered something where they had four ETH, which if you compare it to most rounds is not a lot of funding, but this was an example of how you can actually market in this space. And um, even with just like four ETH, you can still get a lot of activity and, and onboard people into your community. And they were able to get significant traction and momentum by running around on Gitcoin Grand Stack. So this was a use case of showing that you don't need to have a lot of funding to run around. So if you've got a little bit of marketing funding and you want to do something in Web3, 
a potential way of actually making traction in, oh yes, thank you. So yeah, with $2,200, like you can essentially mm -hmm. get awareness and build traction and grants are a really easy way to enter the space. And Joke Race is one I'll mention because I do know their founder in fantastic. So David Phelps, let me link his Twitter. Phelps. So they really help with the promotional side of things with, with rounds and fantastic founder, even like the demo and how to use this platform is super, super simple. So a really good way to partner and enter the space could be run something on joke race and then partner with someone like Arbitrum to help match the funds. And you can partner with a few different communities and get more funding for what you're trying to do. So this is the final one. And then there are a couple of other pieces. So this is my mirror. And here I've written about why communities are struggling to retain interest. And I'm not going to go into that. Um, you can read the piece, but a little bit about, I think a lot of, again, misconceptions, a lot of assumptions that are wrong. And so that's one piece. Another one was around onboarding for DAOs in specific. So yeah, these are a couple of the pieces. <laughs> yeah, helpful. One Super. of the conversations, oh, sorry. Go ahead there, John. One quick question that I had related to protocols. Is that a is that a interchangeable term protocols and blockchain? Meaning, if we're talking about layer two and on the ether uh -huh. blockchain, yep. that's yep. pretty much an interchangeable term. Yeah, I'd say so. Yeah, they're building on a yeah interchangeable okay. terms. Mm -hmm. And a layer two typically builds on a layer one, right? So layer twos are really to make layer ones more accessible. So a layer one protocol is something like Ethereum. But running any transaction on Ethereum is so expensive. So a layer two comes in, takes the load away from the layer one and makes it cheaper to still have it be accessible. There might be some, some giveaways in terms of every layer two has a different thing that they use as their value prop, but the whole point of it is to make it more accessible and cheaper and easier to use. So that's why layer twos are more popular now. And, and yeah, they build on top of an existing technology. Great. Thank you. Is there any particular stack that is more forward thinking as far as the environment and, or is it just who's paying more for carbon offsets? It's a good question. So when Ethereum had this transition, I think it was this year where it went from proof of work to proof of stake. Or am I saying it the other way around? I'm forgetting if it was. Proof yeah. of work to proof of stake. Yeah. Yes. Okay. I always get confused with both, but so that was really important because it really reduced energy, the energy that goes into essentially helping the network run. And so that helped a lot from the sustainability side of things. But from a layer two perspective, they're all so hyper competitive and there's the space is so fast paced that depending on which month you're in, it's going to be a different value prop. And they're all really just growing and developing so quickly. So I don't, I can't say I have a favorite. Because each of them have different things that I appreciate and then some that I'm like, oh, I don't know about this. So <laughs> I think it just depends. And in a lot of ways, those layer twos enable specification of functionality for different use cases, which is nice too. So something that works for one application may not be so effective for another. Uh, so that's where you start to get just more chains that are better suited for exactly what you want to be doing, which is a good thing. Absolutely. Yeah. And, then and I'm sure you hear this all the time just you're talking to an old man here but the similar to what Gary V did with on a marketing level for a nonprofit tying a whether it's an NFT or a token or anything like that to a donation so that it can have so you can build something that has a life outside of the donation so it can be tied to events or it can be tied to special offers or anything with promoters how is that how is the framework thought of like when you, if you're thinking of building something like that where do you start is it back in the day before i had access to your brains i was looking up even like how do you start blockchain but now there's so much infrastructure already and i would love to hear what your ideas are 
Yeah, I've linked two different links here. So events and NFTs at events, so proof of attendance. This is really popular. It's something people get really excited about. People love collecting PoApps and then showing off which PoApps they have. And it's a good way to build community as well. And if I can share my screen for a second. Okay. This is the summer protocols program that I did. This is for a mentorship program that I'm a part of and that I've mentored in. But as you can see, like different events, you can collect PoApps. And this was a way for people to connect with other people and collect their PoApps too. And so this is a fun way to, to do that using NFTs and very easy um, interface and UX to use. So I would say instead of building a new infrastructure, which you can totally do as well, but as a starting point, use these and, and, and look at how they are. The other one is hyper certs. And these are in a way used to build on-chain reputation. And an example of that is if you've donated to a Gitcoin project or you've participated as an, a grantee, you can mint a hyper cert. And if projects donated to you and you were a project that got some funding, you can create a hyper cert for people who funded your project as well. And then they can get to mint it. And so there's different ways to incentivize engagement and participation. It almost acts like a little, almost like a sticker. Was it the Boy Scout stamps that you would get or ba badges? Yeah. It's almost like badges really. So that's what hyper certs are meant to do is you can mint these and then it shows up on your profile and on your Web3 address which acts as your public facing profile in a way. So those are some of the ways that can help with that. And hypercerts are really easy to create as well. So different communities use them in different ways, but if you really wanna reward your community, for example, for showing up, you could also create a hypercert and send it to them. And if you wanna layer it down, there are ways for people to even donate. So what you, they can do is you're like, hey, we're opening this up to community donations. If you'd like to fund us, you can have different tiers of hyper certs and, and they can even then vote on it. So there are different ways of even like breaking it down as, as much as you want. Um, but these are two, two tools that are picking up traction and hyper certs were co-created by folks at Protocol Labs, which is Filecoin Foundation is they've, I think, sponsored this series. Pretty credible, reputable folks and PoApp, again, pretty reputable as well. So those are two names you can trust. And then if I think you want to learn from those, that would be a good start. Yeah, I would add to that and say, I would start with what's the purpose of doing it? Is it a stewardship reward that people are just going to have and look at and think is pretty? Or are you trying to do more with it? And as Michelle was saying, with hyper certs, their bigger, longer term goal was like tokenizing impact outcomes and being able to enable like retroactive funding of those pieces and then have kind of the sharing of the ownership of the of those outcomes. So it's actually quite a bit more complex than say a POAP that as she said is literally just like a badge. Now one of the cool things about POAPs is that your unique collection of badges can actually create a digital fingerprint for you or some sort of version of a decentralized identity. Because the probability that anyone else in the world has the exact same badge mix that you do is very low. And so in some ways, like you could say, okay, what's well, me because I've been to all these different events or at this stage it's a hypothetical, no one's really using it as an identity, but it in some ways it could be used for that in the same way fingerprint can. So there's some cool things happening there. So I would think about, yeah, how deep do you want it to get? Is it just like a pretty piece? But I would also agree that I think NFTs in a fundraising capacity is are better as like a stewardship piece rather than like a sales mechanism, I think. So I would really look at like donor stewardship and then and donor ownership over the community elements again of, of participating as opposed to a lot of charities, their first step is let's sell NFTs and it's going to be great. And then they're really disappointed in the outcome because one, they haven't stewarded the crypto community at all. Many of them want to sell NFTs and don't even have a Bitcoin donation program. And then they, they just don't realize the bigger picture of the community that Michelle's been talking about and what that means and, and how to participate. So there's some kind of cool layers and levels to it all. That is so exciting. Seriously. Like, yeah, it's learning from a fire hose at this point, but it's very exciting. And do you mind ask, breaking down the difference between like w when, as you explain it, the difference between stewardship versus. Yeah. 
I so I spent about 10 years in the nonprofit space before I got into crypto and was doing a lot of the fundraising. And so the a lot of charities are just like ask for money and they forget that there's a lot of the best ways to fundraise are communicating with the donors and making the donors feel appreciated and making them like have a sense of ownership over the work that they have funded. And sometimes that looks like field visits or visits to the office or meetings or just like documents with updates. But with this NFT piece, again, there's that kind of extra layer of, hey, I actually own this token, which is a direct representative of the impact that I funded. And so there's to even take it higher than this, there's companies, IXO protocol is one, IXO, that I worked on a long time ago out of South Africa that is tokenizing these impact outcomes with the goal of trading them on open markets, like you might trade carbon credits. Now, there's I, I see some issues with some of that and there's different layers to it, but that's what they were hoping to do is really this idea of, okay, I, I have a million dollars and I want to fund something. Here's another group that's already achieved it. They've put the token out there. I can retroactively fund this work that has happened um, or use it as a stepping stone to say, I've got a million dollars. I don't necessarily want to put it into this group that is a bit unproven. Here's a group that's already proven they can do it with these tokenized outcomes. Now, where it gets even more interesting is the level of verification you can have for these different tokens can change based on the verification you need as a funder. So one of our earliest projects was a project called Ampli, M-P-L-Y, that in, essentially in South African preschools, the teachers would get paid to teach these underprivileged children that couldn't afford to pay for preschool. But they had to do that by taking paper attendance and then every six months going to the government with their stack of papers and they would tally it and a year or two later they would get paid. So a lot of them didn't want to do it. And Amply essentially created an app where they would just look like an attendance sheet and they just tick, 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 and it would auto pay the teachers in crypto and then create a token that work had been completed to enable others to then buy those outcomes. So you could say the teacher is incentivized to just lie about which kids showed up at school and tick all the boxes. So you could say, we're just going to trust the teacher and that's it. Or you could say, we're going to trust the teacher and the principal has to verify. Or you could say, we need the, each kid to stick their fingerprint in the phone every morning. Or we need each kid to have a geo tracker in their own cell phone that demonstrates that they're at school that day. Or, and so there's these levels of verification that you can decide on based on how much trust you need or trust you have in the, the actual deliverers of, of that um, product or that outcome. So there's some cool stuff happening there. There's another company called okay. Proof of Impact, Chill. I think that was working. Chills. <laughs> Chills, yeah, I know. It's cool. There's some neat stuff. The XO one, I worked on that in 2017. It's been around for a long time. So yeah, that's, there's some neat things. And I think HyperStarts, as Michelle was saying, is doing similar work, I think, but I would say HyperStarts is a more like technical group of people that are building it. And then you get, there's a group called Outcomes X that's doing something similar, but they come very much from the like large scale impact space. So like huge funders, but don't necessarily have the technical expertise that HyperStarts would have. It goes a little bit in the middle. Um, so again, it also depends on who you're serving. Is it like a retail donation market, your mom and pop donating $100? Or are you looking at the German national government that wants to drop a billion dollars into different development programs? And so getting a sense of that, I think HyperStarts in this moment is super cool for techie crypto people and is going to grow, whereas maybe Outcomes X is starting with big money and trying to figure out how to make that work. And again, Excel a little bit in the middle on that. There's some cool things happening in the space for sure. Just absolutely cool. blown away. And yeah, wow. I'll try to find some links here and drop them in the chat for everybody. Well, I'm definitely, I'm be between the two of you, I'm going to be picking your brain so much. Yes. Yeah, we're, we're trying to help other youth service organizations because as I've been traveling the world, I've been seeing that there are these youth, smaller youth service organizations that are doing great work, but they have no idea that there's 10 minutes away an organization serving the same demographic uh, in a very similar way, but they don't know each other exists. And 
So we're trying to take our marketing background and really help and create more of the, the community for them. I love that. And one thing I just want to say, if it feels like this is a lot of overwhelming information, you're not alone. Even people who've been veterans of this industry constantly feel like they're behind on how fast this space is developing, right? And so even though I'm so deeply tapped into this space, I still constantly feel like there's just so much more always to be learning about. And it's completely normal if you're feeling like there's just a lot. And at some point you just accept it and just, yeah, just get used to it. <laughs> I was texting my kids as I was listening. To, after I was listening to you, I was texting them because I was doing that to them about virtual production and about LED caves and about all of the work we've setting up so that kids, young people in other countries can control a camera in our studio. And, and I was type, I'm experiencing it now. I'm getting just completely overwhelmed by new information. So yeah, it, this is fun, especially as an oldie. Like it's so cool to be overwhelmed with something so incredible. It's like another gold rush. A bit addictive it's because everything happens so fast and there's all this new info and you're like oh my gosh and yeah i i took a couple of, of like months not diving into everything super deep and yeah now i'm like oh like i'm behind what do i do i need to get back and so yeah it's, it's tricky but the other comment i would say on some of this stuff is especially with the impact area i think sometimes in crypto we have a love of overcomplicating. And yeah. so it's like you, you create all these like badges and tokens and impact outcomes, and you're trying to trade them on decentralized marketplaces with no intermediaries. And then you're like, did more people get HIV medication or not? Is we spent a lot of money with on all this infrastructure, did it actually create more outcomes? Mm -hmm. And that's where I think we're like, uh, we're not there necessarily, but again, it's like early stages. And I think there's so many applications just basic like money movement alone as an application of crypto and impact like the world food program has been using it in four different refugee camps that they have and they saved three and a half million dollars last year just on bank fees um, and so those are like the little 10 percent wins like that we've just improved the way we do things a little bit and the outcomes are incredible but the way crypto is working is we're not so much working for those 10 percent gains we're looking to blow apart the model. And in the early stages of the blowing apart models, you don't see the enormous outcomes at the beginning. And then all of a sudden you're like, oh, wow, this changed everything and every the way we work completely. So we're still in that kind of deceptive phase where we're building a lot of these products and you're like, this seems complicated. But the end goal is really that at the end of the day, you'll get kind of exponential levels of change in the way we do things. Well, that's yeah, a really good point. Yeah. I'm sorry, Mark, should go up, please. Please go for it. I just, I, your, the idea of what you said initially of like, we're, I'm often thinking about what's the next big thing as opposed to, okay, but did the thank you note get sent for a donation? And did, are you doing the basics to make sure that people feel appreciated and loved? for their involvement, I think where it can really help what we're doing is one of our tenants is transparency. And I think that by giving our donors and our supporters that transparency of this is a way that we're holding ourselves accountable, as well as allowing you to see what guarantee what you're being involved in and giving to through, through this technology. I think that's where it can really help if it's education or educated correctly to your donors. That's a whole other step. There's some questions. I'm going to step back for a little bit. Nick, do you want to go ahead? Yeah. Uh, so I just want to quickly echo what um, Anne just said earlier, that there's a lot of overcomplicating things. I myself have been in uh, blockchain industry for pretty much since the very beginning. And, and and we wanted to build something that's actually more inclusive because I've eventually realized what we were doing was very, it's like keeping the bar barrier very high. I don't think a lot of people understand what 
Texas was doing this is great, but I really, realis- realistically speaking, I really just don't see people onboarding blockchain this way using those MetaMask wallet services. So what we really want to do is going back to the basic. We are building a civic platform as a DAO that want to reward users for civic participation. And one of our product features is quadratic voting, which is very aligned with blockchain. The thing is, this is very, despite all the fact that a lot of those foundations, organizations say they value public good and stuff, we have had a hard time just even opening doors or have scheduling meetings just to share what we're building. For example, we talk, we tried to apply for CELO uh, a while ago, and that led to nowhere. And then we apply for a lot of things that led to nowhere. I'm at a point where I just need to run the idea by the experts, right? And then tell me, how isn't this working? What's wrong with this? So I'm, I'm hoping for a chance to just, in a way, pitching, but not really pitching for money or more like pitching for challenges, right? Like yeah, go months. for it. Well, yes. Is there any way that we can do that? And then this question is also directly at Amasha. We want to, it seems the foundation is doing a lot of things, but I missed my chance to link up with Vitalik when I had a chance. So I just sometimes we just want to have a, a 30 minute conversation with the prominent figures. Now, is there any way to, how can we get that? You know, we deeply believe that what we're building is, is, is for the, for the goodness of uh, humanity. Yeah. So in terms of how to link up with EF folks, so Vitalik is of course really hard to get access to because of how busy he is and how much he's got on his plate, but the EF does have their ESP program, which is our support program. They've got office hours. And so anyone you want to link up with, they'd be good to get in touch with. And then if there's someone in particular, I think they do have a PR slash like, so they've got a sub- subtraction philosophy in the sense that they really don't self-promote in ways and they really try to shy away from that. But any press that comes, of course, is, is good. But they've just, in terms of their organization DNA, that's just something they shy away from but they do really support meaningful work. And so they've got the next billion program and they've got a fellowship program. And both of those really help support. I feel like your project might be a good fit for one of those two. So it's worth checking those out, attending the office hours and getting in touch with the folks who are running these programs. And let me try to find some links for these, but I think those would be good starting points at least. And I'd say the other part is If it's about pitching and getting feedback, there's a bunch of projects. So recently like Artisan did this project pitching round. And so there's different spaces that go on with different ecosystems, right? But a lot of them happen on Twitter and whatnot. So I'd say start engaging with folks again on Twitter and figuring out what are ways that you could essentially either like East Denver is the the other big event that's on my radar right now, but I'd say attending some of the events there and figuring that out would be really good. And then the other part would be the office hours for these programs. What my, I I do think a bunch of the grants teams will be there and the ecosystem folks will be there during these events, right? So see who you can get in touch with and get their time while you're talking to them and understand how you can, yeah, get your feedback there. I think that would be a good starting point. I would also add, so I had trouble getting money out of Cello also. And I think Ethereum Foundation, to be really honest, is quite strict with what they fund two, three, four, five years ago, the grant programs were really broad. People were dumping money at anything. It's not the case anymore. You really need to look at what are the specific needs and wants of all of these different platforms and blockchains that you're building on to see what they're looking for. And I also would say like, Vitalik is not the person you need to talk to. He's not in control of the purse strings. He's not there reading proposals. So I think if you're going after Vitalik, you're probably doing it wrong to begin with. So I would really, as Michelle says, get yourself to East Denver, but then also figure out if you've got a great product that solves a great problem, where's your user base? Like who is using it? How come it's not spreading? What sort of marketing you're doing there? And if you're struggling, I would check out Kernel. K-E-R-N-E-L is like a really... High quality is not quite the right word. It's like an incubator accelerator in the crypto space with the best mentors that you will find, like the greatest 
people it brings together. It itself is chaotic. I find it very chaotic and not the most well-structured accelerator, but the people are incredible. So if you go in there and you start pitching your product while you're as a part of that program, you're really going to get good information about either this is too far ahead of its time or it's not, you're somehow missing that, that product market fit with the type of consumers you're working with. So I would check that out and just see, but yeah, I, I wouldn't get too discouraged if you don't get funded by Ethereum Foundation or Celo, because I think they're, Ethereum Foundation in particular just doesn't, they don't hand out money to a lot of people. They, so uh, they Two different buckets and programs. They are the ones who take the most risk out of all of the different ecosystems, I'd say. So if there's a project that wouldn't typically fit within other ecosystems and their definitions of what their programs are for, the EF would be a good bet for funding those kinds of projects if, the, if they see value in it. But it, it really is worth it to get in touch through the office hours and they can help figure out which, because their teams have different grant funding as well that's available to them. It's not just their typical ESP or they've got a few different buckets in terms of how they fund in, in just in terms of their grant funding. So it would be worth it to figure out who would be the right team even to connect with for something of this sort. Uh, yeah, thanks. I just want to respond to a couple of feedback you, you guys provided. I'm not exactly looking, you know, to reach out to Vitalik. I understand he is not. And then and also, I think we have uh, answers to a lot of questions that people may want to ask. Why are we doing what we're doing? Just want to, I'm not even at the point like asking for money. I understand like I came from that, that background. I'm at the point is like sanity check, idea validation. I, I don't, I just want to start small. And then, but I do want to share with people in the space. Because what we are involved in are civic technology and blockchain. Now, these are somewhat overlapping, but they are actually quite different. So sometimes I would chat up people from civic technology, but they're not really blockchain people. And then people are in the blockchain business are tend to be trading related stuff, right? I don't even NFT to begin with. I call NFT right away, right out that it was just going to be this huge scam. Yeah, I already sent an email to Marsha just like yesterday. I was hoping if I could just schedule a quick meeting with you. I I want to I wanna be able to make you jump off your seat. I think we have something, you know, and, and this is an international scope as well. And it's it's a DAO, but it's not just a DAO. It's going to be a run as a twin engine. It's a social enterprise, and it will have a .com and have a DAO in parallel. So I just hope to uh, have a chance to share this with you. Have you checked out Radical Exchange? I think they yes, might be yes. a good fit for you. Yes, I'm familiar with their work. The The concept of quadratic voting obviously came from uh, doing well, funding as well. Actually, I've talked to Audrey a few times. Audrey sits on the board of Radical Exchange. And then obviously it's from the book Radical Market. So I, without tooting my own horn, but I'm not familiar with this works. And so I'm just, I need people to talk to. And but these people need to be like somewhat expert in this field. The people I've been talking to, they are not really I'm based in Taiwan. So just to answer your question earlier, you asked, okay, where are we targeting? I do have a I have a base now that we're targeting, but this is I'm I'm running into the issue because democracy is can be taken for granted. And actually I don't think a lot of people understand the true meaning of democracy. This is, so sorry, without taking too much time, I know that the, the hour is coming up, so I, I don't want to take up too much time, but just hopefully, Marsha, if you can check your email and then hopefully we can schedule a quick meeting. I Thanks. just shared my calendar link. Feel free to pick something later part of the first week of Jan or the second week of Jan. Just feel free to pick a slot. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you, Anne. No problem. John, go for it. I'll make this real quick because I don't want to take anybody else's time. But so the what I, one thing I found having applied to the Gitcoin uh, round this the this November was one thing I found real helpful. This is just a little tip. Just go through the current rounds and copy and paste what the current makers are doing and see that'll give you a cadence and a flavor of what they're what the current people current rounds are doing people in the current round or the makers in the current rounds are doing find that real helpful the other thing is real quick and uh, i saw something that you were affiliated with or you were giving a talk on solidity 
what I know, I've, I've seen they've done some events in the past and they're in that smart contract area where they're, I guess they're an agency that writes small contra smart contracts. Could you speak to that a little bit about Solidity and what they're up to? Because I noticed they're ever present in at least the Ethereum space. I don't think that would have been me, but Solidity basically is the programming language for Ethereum. So that's the language that people code in to create smart contracts, essentially. I don't know, Michelle, do you have more info on the Solidity side? I'm not a coder, so that's why it's not, not my area. Maybe I just saw you were listed in the conference as a speaker, maybe, and Solidity maybe was sponsoring it. That's, that's definitely I possible. I probably would have been speaking on something else in particular, but yeah, I don't know if, yeah, if you, you know anything more on that. Solidity is more of a smart contract. Yeah. Language. Is there anything in particular around Solidity that I can help with the resources for? They do, they do every once in a while, they do these high level conferences and they're extraordinarily expensive, but they bring together all the thought Are you leaders. You're talking about singularity? Singularity. It could be singularity. Yes. Okay. Yeah, Singularity University is essentially like a think tank out of Silicon Valley in California. And their Absolutely. whole mantra is like, how do we use exponential technology? So technology that kind of grow on this exponential curve to solve problems that impact a billion people or more. So again, it's like, how do we get people out of this mindset of making these problems 10% better? which is pretty much how humans think and how we operate in most charitable sectors, right? You're like, oh, we treated more patients or we fed more homeless or whatever it is. And their whole view on it is if you can use technology as a part of your solution, you can scale in a way that wouldn't have otherwise been possible. For example, if you are, here's a, a great example. There was a story of a, a guy in India who was planting trees by hand and he planted this enormous forest that's bigger than the size of Central Park. But there's a company out of South Africa that is now planting tree trees with drones. And so with one pilot, they can plant 40,000 seeds per day. And so it's just like the scale of what you can do by incorporating these technologies is incredible. So Singularity runs executive programs that bring 80 people from all over the world together in Silicon Valley, and they run them a couple times a, a year. They're not cheap. I will warn you that in, in advance. I think they're about $14,000, but it's a week long. It's worth every penny. And if you want a code that kind of gets you to the front of the application line, I can drop it in the Zoom. But yeah, it's I th that program changed my life and the way I think about everything. So I would highly recommend it. I'll drop a link in there so that uh, if you want to take a look, it's. I'll just mention a little story. I hate dead space. So I want to fill it off a little bit. I was having a conversation with my sister, who's an anti-vaxxer. And uh, she was going on and on about Bill Gates and the Bill Gates Foundation and how basically what it was bad for, she's in the healthcare field. It was bad for basically this to happen because the vaccines that are produced have been, has caused real problems in developing countries and so forth. And so we had this big, long conversation and we came up with Web 3.0. And I said, what we're really, the conversation we're really having here is not anti Bill Gates. What the conversation we're really having here is this neoliberalism and capitalism. And because Bill Gates, I'm sure he started out with good intentions and he's using his philanthropic powers to spread his influence all over the world. And I said, this is not a conversation about anti Bill Gates. It's a conversation about centralized government. However you characterize that, whether it's a neoliberal approach or it's capitalism, classic capitalism. And I just got to believe that from that conversation I had with her, that millennials and Gen Xs and Gen Ys are thinking differently now. And there just seemed to be such a hand in glove fit for these Gen Xers and millennials and so forth that want this sort of thing, that want maybe some alternative to the top down centralized point of view and things like that, where you're criticizing philanthropists for doing what they're doing when they're only trying to do the best. They're working within the system we have. 
So I thought it was a little interesting story about that. Yeah, thanks. I know, I know definitely people in the Web3 are trying to break apart the systems that we've built. And so many of these systems that I think like why some of this stuff in blockchain can be very scary for people is you're breaking apart the very foundations of society, whether it's money, identity, governance, these really big behemoths that have been very stable forces in our lives and in our societies over time. But we've realized maybe they actually don't serve us quite as well as we thought they did. So that's really the underlying look at this is, again, let's not make this 10% better by fixing gerrymandering or opening election lines earlier or whatever. It's let's screw the whole thing and build it from scratch. So I think there's some, yeah, interesting interesting angles yeah. there. Those of us who missed your prior session, we'd love to learn a little bit more about the work that's happening at Auckland around this funding of public goods. Because I think there has been real deep interest in our community about what does that mean and, and how does civil society get into the mix around that? Yeah, sure. So I can start off with the Auckland part. We were a project started by Golem Foundation and the mission really was to fund public goods, essentially. So what we've done is we've taken 100,000 ETH and we've staked it. And then the rewards that come from that staking essentially fund Octant and help fund public goods projects. And how folks can get involved is they can lock in so they can get some GLM and lock it. And once you've locked it for 90 days, you can then vote in the epoch or the the, the projects round that comes up. So you can either withdraw those essentially rewards for personal use, or you can funnel it back into public goods, and then you get to vote on those projects. And that's really how we work. And so we've got our bigger epoch rounds where folks can personally donate to these projects and, and, and really contribute. And we're at that earlier stage right now where every voice matters, and there's a lot of opportunity to really influence how a lot of this funding goes and where it's funneled. But we're starting community rounds now. So we just launched our Shifi Octant round. And not specifically to fund female founders, but we're doing smaller rounds with different communities to help fund projects in those communities and just to help diversify the kind of funding that goes into public goods and just into the space as a whole. Yeah. So if you're part of a community that would want to partner with, we're super open to a lot of partnership opportunities in that way. And yeah, the Shifi one's one I've been really excited about because that was one of the ways I got into this space and it feels like a way of giving back. And again, female founders. Everyone knows how terrible the stats are in terms of funding. And so I feel like whatever, whatever little efforts we can do to help change that, it's important and necessary. Exciting. And so many of the, so such a large part of the demographic that we're targeting is of the underserved young adults that are coming out of being trafficked or homelessness or foster care, they are we value distance traveled. And so we see that the female demographic within that has such a steeper hill to climb. And that's why we we target the some of the jobs that are consistently on the top 100 jobs of the future with AR and VR and mm -hmm. and how that applies to different different verticals, like not just entertainment and game, but also AEC and medical and even fashion now and automotive. So th there's a lot of different applications for, for that and being involved with your type of specializations and is, is just the way of the future. And yeah, I want to learn everything that you have to share. No, absolutely. And let's definitely chat after as well. If you want to join the community, it's, everything's so accessible. I think that's one of the best parts, right? And so even with Octane, just join our Discord, you'll see all the projects that have applied if you actually want to put one thing that I think I mentioned it last time as well, but just like having the public good side, even to projects that aren't as accessible, that can be, that's one way I'm seeing even bigger companies in this space really get funding for projects. And yeah, there's always a way that we could figure out how to make things work. And especially when you're, yeah. I feel like the work that you've done and y'all are doing is so impactful. So I'd love to learn more about that too. Are you guys yeah, funding you... public good stuff that's not crypto things, traditional public goods? Or are you still mostly Web3? We're Web3, but I would love, this is one of those things where I'm like, I think I'd love to see Web2 kind of transition into it. And I feel like that pipeline starts with really helping communities understand how to do this, right? Yeah, but I think so far we've really just been Web3 focused. 
Yeah, and to me, that's I think the other thing that I know this community will be curious about is this these ideas around decentralized governance. Right now, it looks like a lot of the selection of people coming into the shortlist are coming basically through the Golden Foundation. But when, I know there's an ambition to ultimately take some of that into the community as well. Yeah, and so from the governance side, we're actually building out our first governance cycle where what we're doing, and, and we're phased it out. So our first phase and what we're going to experiment with is choosing people who we feel like have really good judgment, sensibility, and bring a really good background and bring really important experiences to the kind of decision-making we want to have and the kind of folks we want on board. So we're running our first cycle based on referrals. And then the second phase, what we want to do is to open it up to folks where anyone can self-apply as well. We just want to make sure that we've ironed out the flow of everything and how we want it to be before we before we open up it up to everybody. So we're probably going to be testing it out. Not probably. We're testing it out the next couple of months. And then I think by the time ETH Denver rolls around, so closer to February and March, I think that's when we're going to probably see the opening up of the application cycle and the, refer the yeah, just like a more open side to that. But, I think it's going to be yeah. a bit of an epic event. <laughs> I think yeah. a lot of people are building towards something for Denver. Yeah, because this is one. And then the other is we're going to have a grant summit. So the state of Web3 grants report that, that um, we published, we're doing a second version of it, and we're doing something called retroactive funding, um, like covering that as a report. And so we're going to have a grant summit where we're going to have a lot of operators or anyone who's interested in grant programs who are going to be able to attend. And, and we're just covering the retro side of it because we didn't touch that at all with our first report that we we published a few months ago. And so um, excited to be going into that. I think that's going to be really fun too. Is that during Denver at the same time yeah. or? Oh, yeah, awesome. yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. We're lining it in a way where we can publish okay. it by the time Denver starts. And so we can, it'll just be more effective to, to announce it and publish it when the community is all together. Yeah. That makes sense. We're coming yeah. down to the end of the hour. So I'm going to, I think, call it for today. 